Okay, from now on, from chapter eight, nine, you're ready to do your midterm. Pick out a project, some data, analyze it according to chapter <coughs> eight and chapter nine. I'll go over that now. So you can pick a problem that hasn't been done. You can pick another, you can pick your own survey or make your own survey. What I'm going to need to know is where the data came from, how you selected it. I need to know the histogram of the data and I need to know, see if you can do an, a QQ plot, normality plot. Then uh, with regard to the actual hypothesis test, you have to come up with some hypothesis to test. And then you have to come up with an alternative hypothesis, okay? So <coughs> that's what this is about. And then we have a test statistic. The test statistic will tell us to accept or reject. And then we have another method other than the test statistics called the p-value. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this thing here now. To begin with, let me go back over to here to give you a general idea. Uh, whatever. Okay, so this time, so this is the final version of the population. Uh, what we want to know about that only God knows. That's our population. And I, the, what we're testing now, and what you have at your disposable to do, disposal to do the midterm will be this. And the population, we know that the sample size is capital N, right? That's the sample size, I mean population size. Okay, now we know that God knows the true mu, mean mu. That's the population mean, right? And we have a sigma, which is the population deviation. And what we may not have seen before, we have this kind of a odd looking P. P is a is the proportion. So supposing I'm asking a question about not so much what's the average height of this whole population, but how many what percentage of population are midgets? For example, there's a certain population, right? That that is a pers that's a pop uh, like a a proportion, right? I'm not asking what God's truth is. Mu. I'm not asking God's truth deviation. I'm asking, does the data show that the 31 percent of the uh, population is something? So when you're talking about a percentage of the population. Not the mu, not the sigma, but a percentage, like, like I just said. What, what percentage are Republican voters? What percentage? And you're going to test hypothesis about this. And this is equal to a population. And we call it a proportion, which means like a, it's, like a, um, it's like a fraction, 31 out of whatever, 100. Let's say that would be, for, or you could say that's, 0.31, or you can say that's 31 percent. It's all good. So you're just saying you're you're not making a claim about this, and you're not making a claim. You're making a percentage of the total, right? And finally, we have whatever it is we have right here, what we call our true or our population distribution. Now, if you have that, it'll be good for the final, right? Because I want to know all of these, and of course. If you have them, fine, but most likely you don't. So we take a sample, unbiased sample, right? And we get us our sample space. And now we're going to bring all of this together, and we're going to now start doing hypothesis testing, which is the art of forecasting. So I know that for my sample, I can subtract, I can actually calculate an average, right? Which is going to be my best indicator, my best statistic to estimate this guy. When I do a confidence interval, a boundary, I'm going to put this as part of the boundary around God's truth, plus and minus an error term. And, and this is going to be, right, this is going to be my sample deviation, and that's going to be the best predictor of this. And if I'm talking about what is the percentage of people in my sample size that are midgets? I would call this guy. What would I call that guy? What's the best estimator P? 
the proportion P. What's the best estimator? No, okay, so that one we call it P hat. That is our proportion, like supposing that our sample shows that our proportion is, you know, 3% midgets, <laughs> right? That's what we're going to do to find out what the true proportion is. See it here? All of these, we can construct now a confidence interval of all of these based on these that calculated by man. Okay, and then what we did to look at the data is we did a histogram. This is a histogram. And this is going to give us some idea of the true distribution of the actual data in the population. Now that pretty much covers it. These are population parameters of which we seek to put a, a, pr a confidence that the truth is lies between this. So, for example, mu if I want to do a confidence interval, confidence interval for mu, I would take mu, let's say, and I'd say, okay, I'm going to put on this side, I'm going to bind it, bound it with x bar, and then I'm going to have some kind of error term, alpha sub 2, and then over here, I'll be bounded by x bar again, minus that same error term, and I call alpha sub divided by 2. Now, if I put that in parentheses and put a p here, big P, this is my confidence interval, let's say, of say 95%. I'm 95 confident that if this thing's run again, that God's truth will be contained in our man-made truth, not man-made truth, our man-made calculation, plus and minus an error term. Okay, now, we're going to have a test statistic so that when we graph this, you know, anyway, this is going to be exactly the same pretty much for mu. I mean, that's mu, right? For sigma... It has a chi-square distribution that you I may or may not have heard of, but it too can be bound, right? I'll be on this side, I'll have, guess what, S. And on this side, I'll have S. But then I'll have what they call a chi-squared. Uh, it is, well, it's just a chi-squared. I'll do it like this. A chi-squared distribution. Uh, and that will be with a certain probability probability of a confidence interval about the sample population deviation. And this too, the proportion, right, of, of a single of a single one, I'm going to have, you know, the true P bounded by P hat <coughs> plus an error term that involves what they call a student T distribution. Alpha divided by two and over here, P hat. Okay, now, and that's going to have a confidence interval. Whatever we want to choose, we could say 98%. And uh, this confidence interval, so we say alpha is equal to 1 minus whatever confidence interval you want. And if you're splitting that among two tails, that'll be have to be alpha divided by 2. That's how much area is on the, e on the corners, on the edges of your, of your distribution. Okay, now, this other one's pretty much just visual. We're looking to see. You can run the QQ test, and, you know, you can basically look at it. Now, so now, the next thing about hypothesis tests for your midterm, you're going to have this thing, right? Any one of these can be graphed, something like this, where you go like this, and your confidence interval is right here. So here's, here's this one. That's going to be X bar right, plus E half over 2, and this is another one, X bar minus E sub alpha over 2. Now, we're going to get this test statistic, and the test statistic is going to be based on what you're obviously, you're saying, you think the truth is. So, you remember, do you recall that we had a, a Z when we were standardizing things? It was X minus Right, and then and then what we're going to do here, and then we divide it by, do you remember the S? Except we're going to do something here. We're going to put H sub naught. H sub naught means the null hypothesis. It's null. Okay, so 
you're going to set up something and you're going to say, I believe that the null hypothesis, you know, is, um, I believe that the law hypothesis is going to be, let's say, um, I don't know, you just whatever you think it's going to be, 21, for example. That would be the null. The alternative would be, you know, that this is mu, mu equals uh, 21, and this one would be mu does not equal 21. So once we calculate the test statistic, we'll see if it falls into here, then we accept this. There should be sufficient evidence to support that, or we reject it for this one if it hits over here and here. Okay, now this area right here, this area, if you were to draw a line and calculate that area under here, okay, that's alpha divided by 2. So these are the critical values here, and that's alpha divided by 2 here too, in this area, right? Now, if you have a test statistic, let's say we have a Z test, I'm going to put a Z test statistic. Let's say it hits right here. Okay? Then if you calculate the area from the test statistic this way, okay, that area on there is called a p-value. Okay? So another way to look at it is just compare the p-value to the alpha sub 2 value without even doing a test statistic. Do you see what I'm saying? If Well, I had to calculate where it hits anyway, so there's my test statistics. But if you see something where they're reporting a p-value instead of a, and you'll see it mostly in the news, they'll tell you what a p-value is, but nobody seems to know. It's, it's the area from wherever the test statistic hit back. So if, if this green area, if the area, right, is larger then whatever numerical area you have for the, this is absolute, abs, alpha divided by 2, and this is a p-value. Okay, if the area of this is bigger than the area of this, just look at the numbers, then that means you're hitting to the left of here, you see? And if you're hitting to the left of here, that's in the acceptance zone. So if you get a calculation of a p-value and compare it to this, if, it's on, if this is bigger than that, if this area is bigger than that, that means your test statistics hitting on this side. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That's called a p-value. But it's the same thing. We're just, we'll see things fit together now because the confidence interval will be hand in hand with hypothesis testing along with how much thing. Now, okay. So basically, that's the, uh, the thing. I think that's the whole course, actually. <laughs> so now it's a matter of finding some data, seeing hopefully it's unbiased in the way it was selected, and then making a claim and seeing if the data supports your claim or not. So I expect to see a p-value. I expect to see a confidence interval. I expect to see some kind of sketching of a distribution and where these things hit. I don't want just the printout or whatever if you just put it on StatCrunch. I want to see it laid out. Any questions? Well, we're going to get into it more now. I'm just, this is the overview. Okay. So let's go back over here. Let's see. So now. Okay. So the basics for hypothesis testing. This is the, really what we've been waiting for, in my opinion, it's the heart of the matter. This is what all, all science is about. This is why statistics is being offered in almost every field. One at some point or another is going to analyze data. If you're going to do a thesis, in math, and or uh, a master's or a PhD <laughs> thesis, a component of your thesis is data supporting or not supporting your and analyzing that data properly. Okay, any questions? Let's take a look at that. So, so here's the hypothesis, as you might imagine. Remember, I told you statistics is really the art of forecast. You're making a claim, and you're seeing if the data supports it. A forecast, for me, is another word of saying hypothesis. You're hypothesizing something, okay? 
And then we're going to test for significance. At no point ever will we say, this shows that we're 100% true. And it will never exist. It will show a probability of being true. We'll never be able to make the claim. So, mm, so property uh, of a population. So, let's see. So, here they have a mu less than 98. Remember, that's, that's something we'd like to maybe test for. But that's usually on your alternative. Okay, so you're always going to have this. You're always going to have the null. And you're always going to have an alternative. Always. And you're going to put a colon like this, okay? Now, what is your claim? Well, it could be about P. You know, you could say, okay, now here I'm going to say I believe P will always have an equality. I believe that that's 0.5, right? The alternative depends how you want to. You can either say P is not 0.5. That could be your alternative. Okay, now if you use the word not in the alternative, then you're going to automatically have a two-tailed test. So when you say it's a bell curve distribution, and now it's going to tell you you want a certain confidence of, let's say, confidence interval of, of 95%, right? That equals, and that subtracted from 1, right, will be 0 0.05, right? And uh, I'm just doing the, yeah, that's 1 minus alpha is going to be 1 minus whatever you want for confidence interval. Okay, now, if, it's, if it, the alternative is this, this is going to require two tail test. So that, because when it's greater than, so in here you're going to have half of this alpha divided by 2, and over here half of alpha divided by 2. If you remember from that, you can construct and find these z critical values. Does anybody remember that? Okay, so the, the alternative determines whether it's a one or two tail. So if I wrote it like this, for example, and I put P is greater than 0.5, okay, let's say, whatever it is, then, then that's a one-tailed test. So I'll get rid of this, this one. And instead of having a, just an alpha sub 2 in here, I'll have my whole alpha right in here, because I don't have to divide it in two. Remember, on the, on the population side, we have God's truth mu, God's truth the proportion of how many midgets per se. And, and then we have sigma, which is a deviation. All of these parameter, population parameters, we'd like to put, we start to make claims about them. Uh, you can see in the court of law, you know, if there's experts coming and arguing and looking at the data, then they can support when you see, for, for example, and they test for the DNA, and then they say the likelihood of that being somebody else, they never say it's 100%. Just the likelihood that that somebody else is one in three billion <laughs> something or another, it's like extremely unlikely, unlikely it's not him, that it is him okay, or her or whatever. It's okay? Okay, so uh, when you use stat crunch, or something. Now, the, the depending on, you, you'll pull up which distribution you want, but see, it's, it calculated your Z critical value. It calculated your test statistic, right? And it also calculates a p-value. But right off the bat, I look at my p-value and I say, okay, depending on, here's, uh, you know, on my interval, whether or not, this can already tell me if it's going to be accepted or rejected. And here's the interval, confidence interval, of a 90%. You see that? So that means <coughs> alpha is going to be equal to, well, if you're doing a hypothesis test, do you see what the alternative is? The alternative is the proportion is greater than some number that we come up with, yes? So what that means, <coughs> is it a one-tail or two-tail test? One-tail. Because this saying, that's the alternative. I'm t that's already telling you. 
that the null hypothesis It's telling you right off the bat, you may not see it, but the null hypothesis is always going to say P, let's say, is equal to 0.5, let's say. And now it's, does, it's looking for an alternative that P does not. As soon as you say does not, you realize that whatever distribution this is, it could be a student T distribution, it could be a bell curve, whatever. As soon as you see that, you understand that this is like this, see? Now, we have a test, that, so, so let me just show you how this works. So that means that the p-value, yeah, so I'm going to take my alpha, right? My alpha is going to be, well, what is the confidence interval? Well, the confidence, they want it how confident? 90%. True? So that's the confidence interval. Now, if that's the case, that means alpha is going to be equal to 10%, right? Or 0 0.01. True? Okay. If it's a two-tailed test, I'm going to have to split that in two. So now I say alpha divided by two is equal to 0 0.005. Do you see that? Okay, now I, I could look at it right there and I say, okay, now look at this. I got a p-value of 0 0.0054. Is that bigger or smaller than 0 0.005? It's not a hard problem on a question. Is this. Which is the bigger number? This number? Well, they got it rounded off there, or this number. It looks pretty close, but I would say that this p-value is bigger than this value by four ten thousandths. Do you see that? So that means that if I plotted my test statistics somewhere, I expect it to be just a hair over here, so that the red area is just going to be a little bit bigger than the alpha error <laughs> area. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So it looks like we're going to accept there's sufficient evidence to submit the null. Pretty cool? OK, so we'll, we'll go over it more in hand. But basically, you're going to have your distribution. You're going to have to decide how confident you want to be. By deciding that, you can decide how much area is going to be in the ends of the thing. I don't want you to confuse the two areas. Because there is a test statistic that hits at about 2.555. And I'm assuming it's going to be about 2.55 here where the red hits. And this other one's going to be another number here that they have. Um, the critical value is 1.644. So uh, let's see. The test ticket would hit, would hit to the right of that, though, wouldn't it? Uh, Okay, so the P is being between 51 and 56 percent. <coughs> so we'll check it. Let's go to next. Okay. So there's this first step into making your hypothesis test. <coughs> guy, I don't know, wherever you work, somebody shows up and is a supplier. And he says, this has certain purity. Okay? Certain purity. That they mean has a certain pur purity. Okay, so once you make that claim, right, that's how you start to, s now, now you're going to have to have a symbolic form of that claim. The symbolic form is going to be of this nature, where you're identifying the null. So you own ice cream stop, and they're delivering you. They say this has 20% cream in it, which is what you need, ideally. So in that case, you might set up, you, you take a sample of your different batches of ice cream that have come in, and you check some moisture. And so you might say, OK, the null hypothesis is set up so that usually I'm calling the person a liar. Uh, OK, let's try that again. So the null hypothesis here is um, one's going to be saying, OK, here's the alternative. So now what I'm going to say is he's saying, I can say one of two ways. He's saying that the average moisture is like, for example, 0.2, right? 
And you don't care from your perspective. You just can't use the ice cream if it has too much or too little cream. So your alternative is going to be that it doesn't equal 0.2, let's say. So now that has helped us decide. This symbol has decided whether it's a one or two tail. Next step. This is exactly the steps you go through. Um, so now, remember I was telling you about alpha. You decide how confident you want to be. <coughs> okay, so you want to be. You want to decide now. How do you construct? whether you want to use a 95% confidence or a 99% confidence. One will cost you more time and effort to do, but you're more sure to have the correct boundaries, okay? That, that the idea of, let's say, uh, so, the, so let's say the uh, null hypothesis, we have two types of error. We'll have an error, error well, I'll put it here. We have error one, okay, what we call error one, error one, and of course error two. Okay, so this, when we, when, we, when we talk about this guy here like this, and we're putting our alpha in here, or alpha divided by two, it doesn't matter. So <laughs> you can see as that area gets smaller and smaller, right, the acceptance range is getting bigger and bigger. So this is the probability of getting a false positive. Error one is, a is the probability of it showing that it's accepted when it shouldn't be. And the error two is exactly the opposite. Oops, this is error two. Okay. So basically what I'm saying is that the way you're setting up your confidence interval and, and is a way you want to minimize your two errors. One is having a false, a false negative. That is that you're saying you're rejecting it when you should have accepted. Okay? If you're talking about a hypothesis, not about ice cream, but an AIDS test, you know, then you worry about telling somebody, you know, they don't have AIDS when they do. It's critical. <laughs> It's worse than this kind of error, maybe, that you've been told you have it when you don't actually have it. Okay, so by design, we'll tell you how you want how tight you want to set your your perimeters. Okay, now these are the two methods that I'm asking you to use both methods on your home on your midterm. Okay, one method is going to be um, where we find the p-value. And that's not, they're really, they're really related. But I'll show you what I mean. So on this one, okay, we're going to find that p-value, right? And what is the p-value? The p-value is the area, the p-value is going to be the area from your, wherever your test Statistics hits, and we haven't done any yet, but I'll do them. Wherever your stat hits, that area from here to here is your p-value. Okay? Once you calculate that. Now, you also have something when we set up the confidence interval called critical values. That could hit here. And if I make a little here and do this in red, this area here is your alpha divided by 2. Okay, so one is construct this confidence interval, yeah, underneath here, and just see where this test statistic hit, and you're done. The other one is compare this p value with this alpha divided by 2 to see which is bigger. Both of those will be ending up either to reject. And the way you should say it, and I'll just give you the wording of how you reject or should just. Okay, so now at the very end, you're restating what the data shows, whether you accept or, or not. So one of the languages that they use, I mean, the language that's used to 
to state it's it's it has to be uh so the confidence interval method is is what it was the second one right so these are different confidence intervals one tail or two tail okay and then the hypothesis is uh because a confidence interval estimate of the population parameter contains likely values of the parameter, uh, reject the claim that the proportion parameter has a value that is not included in the interval. Okay? This takes practice, of course, but that's the flow chart. That's all you have to do. Now let's look at one. Uh, Okay, so let's suppose we have some NIHOP where, where we also have a proportion, right? And we can have two, two, a before and after result. We can have, I'm implementing a new teaching technique, and these were the test scores before it was put in, and this is a test score, let's say, afterwards, right? You take each individual person who took a test, and you take that difference each one of those differences, right? Those differences have a distribution that can be tested. So you're testing whether the distribution would be zero. Whether, right? That means there's no, that there was no difference in the, in, this, in the help. Okay, so now, here's just an example. We're saying that the proportion of whatever, we believe it to be 50%. And I told you on the alternative, that's H of one. See, that's H sub O. That's the null. Notice that these now are determining whether it's a one or two tail test that you're going to do. Next now, what we haven't done probably is going to find the, the test statistic to see if it goes in or we can graph. Let's see. Uh, so, uh, so you notice that the equality, you see the equality symbol? You'll never find that directly with this alternative it'll be the closest you'll be is not equals to the equality always goes with the null okay and uh, so here's a possible alternative the null is this but the alternate uh, is it's greater okay now here's a case that you might not if you want to do your own data it says, if you're conducting a study and want to use hypothesis to support your claim, your claim must be worded so that it becomes the alternate hypothesis. You're actually trying to, you know, show that the guy's a liar. So that, remember, the cream is not equal to whatever. All right, that's your alternative, really, is its thing. So, uh, alpha, the test, that we talked about alpha, uh, of the hypothesis is the probability value used to is the cutoff for determining the sample evidence. So significant level of alpha equals the, the probability of rejecting when it's true. That was a type two, type two error. Uh, that's a type one error. Okay, we don't, don't worry about that right now. Let's get one under our belt here. Okay. Now this, These are different distributions. That's called a chi-square. And that's a student T distribution, OK? So this table should tell you which test to use for what. And uh, so it depends if we're talking about the proportion. OK, so example, the claim is that P is higher than 5 per 50%, OK? So uh, the no and then. Uh, we're doing a population proportion. If you remember, we usually do that. We usually do it with a binomial. But if the sample size is big enough, this is holds true and this holds true, right? We can use a normal distribution. So here are the test statistics, OK? So all right, so now look at our parameters. There's that P for proportion. There's mu, or God's truth at average. There's uh, mean mu. This is, a, uh, this is the central limit theorem, or the means 
themselves have a distribution. And then this is how we put a boundary around the deviation. It has a chi-square distribution. And this is the, and these are the test statistics. Okay, so let's suppose you have a test statistic like this, so that you have this. Let me show you how that works. So let's say you have a null hypothesis as they're doing it. Let's say that P is uh, equal to 0.5, right? And then however you want to set up the alternative, or H1, P is whatever greater than or equal to 0.5, okay? So that tells me it takes a one test, one tail test, okay? Now, notice what my claim is. My claim is this, yes? So now, in order to construct a test statistic, I'm going to replace this P with 0.5. P hat comes from our data. So it's a difference between the hypothesized God's truth and the man-made God's truth, divided by its deviation, which is PQ over N square root, OK? If I'm talking about a null hypothesis, not about the, the true proportion of midgets in the world, we could have H of O, the alternative, and I'm saying mu is equal to 0.2, for example, that the God's true average is equal to that. So the alternative, or H1, would be that it doesn't, for example. This doesn't means it's a two-tailed test, yes? So now, when I'm testing for a test statistic to see whether I'm in the reject or the accept, here's my, my, my different distributions. If I know it's a normally distributed Z, guess what that mu gets replaced with? It gets replaced with what I think is a mu naught. This guy. X bar we got from our sample data, right? And this one, they either give it to us or we use S. Okay, this one actually using S, this one you know sigma's known or uh, sigma known and n is greater than 30. Okay, so it is the nature of the hypothesis that you're setting up will actually determine the test value. Okay, so let's, let's show you what I mean by that. Any questions? Okay, so let's try it. So you see what's happening. I'm going to do an actual test statistic now, or they're going to do it. So from example one, we have this claim that we think that the true proportion on the God side, right, from a sample size of little n of 1,000, right, and x equals 554, right? So 554 of that, or whatever. So it's, notice that I've set up a proportion, right? It's this divided by that. That's my p hat. It's the number of midgets in the total population. I'm not asking about God's mean average. I'm not asking about the. I'm asking about a particular question of a proportion of the total amount of of midgets in the world. Let's say at any one time. And so I have x divided by n. That is p hat. And, but we're going to say that we think that the, the, the null hypothesis that p, that the true p amount is, we're, we're stating it. We believe it to be 50%. So in, in this type of thing, the, that is a success. The alternative is 1 minus that. Not the alternative, but the, the failure is one minus p, okay? So now we're gonna take a look at that and then we're gonna say, all right, now we have to come up with a test statistic, a z test statistic. This is not the same as a z critical value, okay? This is a z test statistic because what we're gonna do is we got this set up right like this. So we're setting this as our, our null hypothesis that P is going to be equal to 0.5, and the alternative is, uh, I don't know what they want to do for an alternative, but let's say, let's say that we have uh, the alternative 
is, uh, or is, is it rho p is not equal to 0.5, okay, for sake of example. In this, now, what we have here, then, let's say, because we have, uh, we can see if we can use a normal distribution. You know, we look at NP and we see if it meets those guidelines being greater than 5. Okay, so, uh, now, look what happens here. So, uh, we can evaluate, shown, okay, the test statistics of 2.55. Uh, so, we're going to replace P hat, see it, with what it actually came out to be in our sample space. 0.4, correct? That's what, look, all of them are going to be this way. You're going to have what's coming out of your data minus what you think God's truth is. Always. It will be that way. So is 0.54 significantly, statistically significant bigger than 0.5? Right? And then we got P and Q. Remember, it's 1 minus P is Q. And then we divide by N. And that came out to that is our test statistic. Now, <coughs> so how am I going to test or make a claim? Well, let's say I have a distribution based off of your histogram or whatever. And what I'm saying is that you're going to have to be given a confidence, how confident you want to be. You tell me. Well, how is that set? That's set according to whether you want to minimize an error one or an error two. So if it's not real critical, we can say 95%. You want a confidence interval of 95%. Okay? So, that's the same as saying 1 minus that would be alpha is equal to, you know, 5%, yeah? You know? That's 5%, right? So, or you can say that that's 0 0.005, right? So, this is a two-tailed test. <coughs> so, I'm going to have my x critical values. My critical values are going to be, this is going to be 0 0.00. Uh, two five. 0 0 0.0025 and 0.0025. All right. What do I want? I want my critical values, the Z critical value and a Z critical value. Okay. Now, how do I calculate that? That's easy. We use the book to tell us that much area converts into a Z score. So let's say that this is minus 1.96. And this is 1.96. I'm just, I'm, I haven't looked, but let's say those are the Z critical values, right? Now I come with my test statistic. And I want to know where that lands. So then I say to myself, well, 2.54 lands well over here. Yes? Okay, so what does that mean? This area, if your test statistic lands between here and here, which is the same as your confidence interval, <coughs> you're going to accept. You're going to accept anything over here, out here or out here, you're going to reject. Got it? This is where is this hitting? Clearly, it's hitting in the reject area. Yes? So we're going to say that we reject a null, and the evidence appears to support the alternative, that the dude's a liar or whatever. OK, critical and rejection regions. One tail, this is the acceptance. Tail to the left, this is the acceptance. If your test statistics hits in any of the green parts, it's rejected. I'm saying the null is rejected. It's giving you information either way. And that's what we just did. I showed you the picture there of the, the rejection. Um, okay, now, remember that was the one, the one way we did it. We're using the test statistic. Another one is to use the p-value. Now, let me show you that, that uh, uh, drawing that I just did. Did I have it? Yeah. OK, now, do you see the area of the red? Here's, here's 1.96, right? 
this area in the red over here, because it's a two-tail, I know the area, and that is alpha divided by two. And what I have to do is compare it to the area from here on back, of the, from the rejection, from the test statistic. Here's the test, and I think you can argue that this. Can you see that this area is going to be smaller than this area? When this area is smaller than this area, that also means reject. So I can look at alpha divided by 2, and I look at the p-value, and I can tell you right already. I didn't actually calculate the test statistic, but do you see what I'm saying? You'll use both to show in both cases that they support or reject. Okay, so our parameters got mu, p for proportion, midgets, sigma, and a histogram for the belt for the distribution. Okay? And now we're actually testing out whether the data supports your thesis or not. Okay. Okay. So this is the flow chart well, using the p value. Okay. So, we need to know what type of test we want to use, depending on the data, the distribution. Okay, so here it is. It's just, if it's a right tail, left tail, left, right tail. Okay, so the p this p-value equals the area to the left of the statistic. That would be like that. And this one would be, the p-value would be that to the right of the statistic. I just showed you that the blue area was smaller than the green area. That was the area to the right of the test statistic is the p-value. You can see that the test statistic is intimately tied in with the p-value. So if you have a test statistic, you can say, yeah, it hits in the rejection zone, or you can say it's, it's either bigger or smaller than the alpha divided by 2. And a lot of times you're going to have p-values. You're not going to have a little chart or a picture or anything. So you can maybe look for the test statistic, but more than not in the newspaper, when you see somebody, they take a survey uh, of politicians, and then they say, if you'll notice, that they have like a plus and minus, a certain error term. Okay. So um, if your test statistic hits here, that area to the area left is your p-value, right? And uh, here is... When you have, you know, these one-tail tests, you're putting all of your alpha in there. And then this is the one to the right. So you need to determine the difference. Okay, so any questions? It just takes some practice, I think. Uh, now, the other one was the critical value method, right? That's the one I did before that. The critical value is when you take alpha divided by 2 you look in the guts of the table and you find the corresponding Z value or T value or chi value, yes? And that gives you your confidence interval bound for which you'll either accept or reject. In this case, you know, we'll have this thing here. Okay, so we have an alpha divided by two. If you go to the table, or the area under the curve or whatever, it tells you that the Z value is 1.645, right? Now, <coughs> we want to take a look at how does that compare with the p-value? Or anyway, that area here, okay, so, so we, that's one thing. And then, so now, we're going to have a test statistic. The test statistic is going to either land here or here. Yeah, over here, we reject the null. We accept the null. When you reject, it's going to be in favor of the alternative. Okay? So this will require the test statistic. They're all tied in. I mean, it's the same thing. It's just different ways of what you want to look at it. Okay, so make a decision to either reject or fail to reject. 
than no, okay? So, uh, failure to reject means it looks like it's right. Okay, you can't, okay, so here we are with, uh, here, they tell you what alpha is. They're even telling you the p-value. Okay? I'm pretty well done. Okay, only to the extent that I have to know if it's a one-tail or two-tail to see whether I have to divide that by two or not. But if it were one tail, you know, I could say that this is going to be alpha is larger than this by a long shot. This is, you know, ten, five one hundredths. And this is five one thousandths, right? So if I had to do, if it were a tail, a test tail to the right, you know, and then I have this, let's say going down like that. So now I'm saying my p-value is from my test statistic my test statistic back. Now here we go. That area now is my p-value. Okay, but if I look at it compared to the you know that, okay. But now I'm going to look at my alpha. Well, alpha is really small, so the area is going to be back here somewhere. This is smaller than this in area. So that's a reject. Okay. Now, if it were a two-tail, we'd have to divide that into by two. And then maybe it'll change. Uh, they could tell you the test statistic. That's the one. That's the critical value. So we reject a null hypothesis. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So here's how you should say it the wording of the final conclusion. You need to word it in this way. Okay. <coughs> so, there is, there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that, that's your null. No. Uh, original claim does not include equality. So, so now we have an alternative without equality. So there's not significant evidence to support the claim. Okay, so uh, accept, fail, or reject. Okay. We should say we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's how you're saying you don't, you're not so much accepting it. You have failed to reject it. The null. Okay. Because they say the term accept is misleading because it implies incorrectly that the null hypothesis has been proved. It hasn't proved anything. Okay, it just proves that it's not that. And But we can never prove the null hypothesis. We can fail to reject it more completely. Okay. Is it exciting? Uh, <coughs> confidence interval for a hypothesis test. You'll find that they're all interconnected. Now, uh, over here, the confidence interval is the same, is equivalent to the hypothesis test in the sense that they lead to the same conclusion. It's true for both the mean and this. This one. Not sure. Okay, here, alpha. Do you remember what we talked about alpha is, right? F that we derive from our confidence interval, right? Alpha also is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true. That's the type 1 error. This is that you have AIDS, uh, and you've been told you don't have AIDS. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um. So, this is just helps you design according to the, if you're working something that has to do with pregnancies or some medical thing, you want to be a pretty tight error one. But it's at expense of error two. You can never narrow both of them down. It's one or the other. Right? Mm. These are your different type error one, error two. We went over that. Um, power, we don't really need that. I'm not going to, 
and this is how to find the proper sample size. You I, I think you can understand that the sample size will be determined by how tight your your alpha is. So if you want more and more chance of being correct, at least showing that it's correct, then your sample size will have to grow. But you'd be surprised how small your sample can be in order to make a meaningful estimate about the population. You know, you only need a national uh, election, maybe a thousand people. I don't hear it at all now. Oh. Hold on a second here. Can you, can you hear it? In this case, it's denoted by H sub 1 or sometimes H sub lowercase a or even H sub uppercase a. And that is the statement that the parameter has a value that somehow differs from the null hypothesis. Boring. And for the methods of this is, could be the greater than, the less than, or the not equal to for proportions, could be the greater than, the less than, or the not equal to for means. If we're working with means, or if we're testing a claim about a standard deviation, then the alternative might either be greater than, less than, or not equal to, given a standard deviation. So that's why there are three different forms for the alternative hypothesis, each for pro populations, means, and also standard deviations, to give us a possible total of nine different ones. Now, of course, each problem would only have one alternative hypothesis. You would just have to determine which of these nine oh, and alternative hypotheses. For, okay, that means the, the mean weight is at least, would be represented Let's by see this problem here. for the indicated parameter. That we're the m and pro Problem is referencing mean weight. That means we're going to use the symbol for mean. So we're going to use mu for the indicated parameter that we're um, going to look at. So for step one, we're going to express the given claim is at least, okay, that means the, the mean weight is at least would be represented by the mathematical symbol greater than or equal to 0 0.8535. So that's the first step that we're going to do is just express the um, given claim in the problem in symbolic form. Then for step two, we're going to see if this is false, then what do we have? So if the mean is not greater than or equal to, what would we have? And what we would have is that the mean is less than 0 0.8535. So that must be true if this one is false. So that in step three, we see that the expression, the mean is less than 0 0.8535, does not contain the equality. So that means we're going to let the alternative hypothesis, state sub one, that will be the mean is less than 0 0.8535. So that means that the null The number one is the only one that has an equal sign in it. Will be the equality. So that will be that the mean Remember, the null will have the equal sign. 8, 5, 3, 5. So that here are our hypotheses expressed in symbolic form. The alternative being that the mean is less than 0 0.8535, and the null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to 0 0.8535. So we have our two hypotheses here. And a few textbooks use the symbols less than equal. No, it wasn't quite yet. Let's see, I want to show them use a test to test it. Now we have several other things to consider as well because we're also going to be looking at the test statistic. And it's going to be used in making decisions about the null hypothesis. We'll be using standard deviation and you need a test statistic for that. Then we have something called chi squared. So we'll look at that formula. When we're working with chi squared, the way you find the test statistic is n minus 1 in the numerator. That quantity times the sample standard deviation. Do you remember that we were subtracting p from p hat and mu from what we sub mu the, the what we came from the believed to be God's truth? If this one here, look at it, how they do the deviation. We're not subtracting. So I want to want you to look at that chi square distribution because what is it? It's 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 a ratio between what the sample deviation is and the true population deviation. There, uh, well, that's not it. 
That's for the proportion. But notice you have p hat minus p, right? P is what we think it is. P hat is what our data says it is. P is what our hypothesis is. So now if you're talking about mean, notice I'm not p hat anymore. It's how far mu is God's truth from x bar. See the top row? In the top row there, above that, p hat, how far is p hat from p? S is a little different. It's going to be the ratio. The only difference if you're using t is that you don't know the population standard deviation, so you have the sample standard deviation here instead. You still got sample mean minus population mean over the fraction that is now the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So depending on the problem you're working with, you might be using one of those test statistics. Or if instead you're going to be using standard deviation and you need a test okay, watch. for that, then we have something called chi-squared. So we'll look at that formula when we're working with there. See, what do you have? It's a ratio between, this is from man's sample deviation, right? And this is what the null hypothesis, your claim that you're making it. So it's a ratio. So it's a little bit different instead of subtraction. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, oh, in time. That's the degree. This would be perfect for, you know, your midterm, so something like this. So it's a ratio. What's p hat going to be? 516 divided by 580. <coughs> That's what we're theorizing it's going to be. That's your null. It's way to the right, is why. Just to 
denoted by alpha. We've used a little bit in the past. And that's 1 minus the confidence interval. See if p value is less than alpha. Anyway, that's it. You can check out those movies too. I think that's it, unless you have a question. Yeah, actually, you have to go through them before you even do the problems. <laughs> 